Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went out that he, Jesus, entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted, one translation says cumbered, about with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Stop there. Everybody can relate a little bit to this, I'm sure. You have one person who is interested in the things of God, and you have another person who may theoretically be interested in the things of God, but not right now. Yeah. Come on. All right, good. Come on. Which one are you? No. So we're going to talk about being interested in the things of God. Where are the true seekers of God? What if God Almighty wanted to say something to you? What if God wanted to say something to you? What if the creator of the universe wanted to speak directly to you? What if Jesus was talking today? Would you be there? If Jesus was talking, would you be there? Even in this busy life? Think about all the excuses that we had for years and years and years. I spent 26 years of my life too busy for God. What do you mean too busy for God? Yeah, yeah, I was busy serving my own life. I was busy trying to live it up. But then I found out there was something I was missing. And it was this holy God talking to me. Amen. And when the holy God talks to you, you got to stop. And you got to make time. And you got to ignore the busyness around you. Well, I can't do that until this is finished. Well, no, you can't do this until that is finished. That's right. That's right. you got to pick your one thing. What, what is the one thing in your life that takes precedent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the key to success in every area of life. You've got to decide what is the one thing that is your main purpose in life. What is the one thing that you always devote time to? What is the one thing that wedges in your schedule Every time, every day, every week. What is the most important one thing that you devote your time to first? Sure, there's a thousand things to do. Let's make sure they begin with number two and end with 1,000. What's the number one thing that you must do? This is why people fail in business, in life, in relationships. They're not doing the thing that's most important because so many other things seem to rob us of our time. Isn't that right? Amen. Your life depends on you doing the first thing first. Years ago, Johnny taught this lesson on seeking God first. Seeking God first. And if you don't seek Him first, you never will. If you don't seek Him first, it'll all be weird. Your whole Christian life will be out of whack if you don't seek God first. First. First in the daytime. First during the week. First priority. When He comes up, everything else takes a second fiddle. That's right. That's right. And Joni likened it to buttoning a shirt. Have you ever buttoned your shirt up and you, and you missed the first button and you got number two hole in the first button? What happens? You can button everything else. You can do everything else normally. It's, it's bad. Right? Like don't go out of the house looking like that. We can say that about your spiritual life. If you're not putting the first things first, don't you go out of the house looking like that. And that's why we get into weird strife and, and, and arguments with people. That's why our, we have no peace, no joy, no hope. We lose our spiritual strength. It's because we got the first bu button in the second hole. Amen. Amen. And you're just off kilter. Because you didn't do the... You're busy though. I mean, you're busy. Like Martha. Martha, Martha was busy. She was doing... Well, don't you see? Don't you see? i got to do all this natural stuff. I can, how can I do something spiritual? i got all this natural thing. If I don't take care of the this and the that, how... how Who's gonna? Yeah. 
I mean, she's so upset about this that she wants Jesus to tell Mary to stop being spiritual and go help in the kitchen. Come on. Amen. Well, I got these kids. I got, these, I got to take care of these kids. Listen, if you don't put your first thing first and get into your Bible and pray... Come on. Amen. Well, you know, we, can, we can't get to church because we never got the kids this and the kids that and the kids... Listen, if you neglect putting church first, your kids will be off kilt the rest of their lives. Right. Not to mention you. That's right. So people just got it all out of order. All right. Now that I've uh, scared everybody in the whole place. <clears throat> look at chapter 12 here. Luke chapter 12. That's to the right. This is just the basic necessities of life. Verse 22, Luke 12, 22, He said to His disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, nor about the body, what you shall put on. Life's more than meat, and the body is more than clothes. Stop there, I won't read the rest, but I want to skip to verse 29. And do not seek what you should eat, or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. This is basically saying stop worrying about your money. Stop worrying about your getting your needs met. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows you need these things. God knows you need a job. He knows you need these things. You better stop having an anxious mind. You need to stop worrying because your Father knows this already. He's not going to let you go without if you can stop being anxious about it. If you're anxious about it, if you're not trusting properly, He can't get you the job. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. That means the unsaved people are worried. Why would you be worried? Those without God as Father are worried. Why would you be worried about basic stuff? He'll take care of your basic stuff. And, and to have a job, at least in Houston, Texas, you need a car. So that means He'll take care of your car. And if you, need a, if you get a car, you need gasoline. He'll take care of your gasoline. He'll take care of all the things in line for your basic necessities. And if you've got a good job, you need good clothes. He'll take care of your clothes. No, no, some, some jobs, they supply the clothes. I understand. Verse 31. There's a but. 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 Seek first. Seek the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added to you. So you get to have this great blessed promise of all these things added to you. All of your needs are taken care of. But seek the kingdom. Amen. If you'll do the seek the kingdom, the, the, Matthew 6 says, but first seek the kingdom of God. Yeah. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Well, that's what Mary was doing. She was listening to Jesus. That's called seeking the kingdom. That's called learning how the kingdom operates. That's called learning how my Christian life is supposed to be lived. That's called learning the Word of God so that I can apply these things and have a right heart, a right spiritual life, and then a right lifestyle, a right natural life. That's called seeking the kingdom of God. And those of you who've been coming to church a lot, you're seeking the kingdom of God. And I just want you to know that that's vital to you. And I also want you to know that that means all these things are added to you. Just cast off the anxiety for seven days in a row and you'll see it start working for you. Hallelujah. So, if God wanted to say something to you, how would He say it? If God, see, because we don't see Jesus, it's easy to hide from Him, right? I mean, if Jesus was standing right here, you couldn't hide. If Jesus appeared in all of His glory, you would just hit the dirt. And then you'd chase Him all around the room, and you'd follow Him home, and you'd chase Him down the road because He's so glorious. But you can't see Him, therefore it's easy to hide. Out of sight, out of mind. But you're looking with your natural eye. If, it's, if we just look with our spiritual eye, and God wants to talk to us, and you want to listen, how many of you want to listen to God? How many of you want to know the Word of God? If God's going to speak to me, that means I'm interested in His words. 
Well, we know that God has given us His words. This Bible is the Word of God. This Bible is the Word of God. This is how God primarily speaks to His people. Now, He also can speak through His Spirit to your spirit. That's a whole other lesson. That's another teaching, another message, another truth you have to get familiar with is how the Spirit speaks to your spirit. If God speaks to you directly, personally, it's going to be in your heart, in your spirit, man. You need to learn that or you're going to miss a whole lot of good stuff in this life. But that's another lesson. This one is, I want you to understand how valuable this Word of God is. These, these words on these printed pages are so valuable to us. The Bible is so important for our life. Without it, you can't live. Jesus said, heaven and earth pass away, but my words will never pass away. He said, man shall not live by bread alone or food alone. Good restaurants, you can't live by good restaurants alone and good cooking at home alone. You can't live by breakfast, lunch, and dinner alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how you live. So everybody that's not listening to the Word of God is not really living. Everyone that is not learning and seeking and desiring to know the words of God is not living. I said you're not living. You're faking it. It's the truth. We're deceived. If you're not, if you're not seeking the, the word of God, you're deceived. And that's scary. I wish I could scare people into the Bible, but you can't. And right now, most of you... Most of you are thinking, yeah, that's true. But then tomorrow, do you remember it? Tomorrow, do you become a Martha? Just busy? That's good. All right. Turn to Proverbs with me. We're going to try to stay in Luke mostly, so don't, don't forget where Luke was. But I do want to read you a couple things from Proverbs. It's over in the Old Testament, the middle of the Bible. If you just thumb through the middle, you can't miss it. How many of you think God is smart? <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing that those who run from God, don't care to know anything about God, uh, think they're smarter than God. It's amazing. Yeah. To live your life as your own God, thinking you're smarter than God. Thinking that this is all ancient history stuff, not applicable for today. That's why you're so ornery. That's why you're so weird. That's why you've missed all the holiness and purity and love and glory and hope and peace. And Nobody's smarter than God. If you'll, if you'll seek God, you'll learn some things. Hey, I, I know when I was 26 years old, I recognized, I was honest enough to recognize that last week I was an idiot. And that this week I was one step further from being an idiot. I started reading Matthew and I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know that was in there. That, that just seemed so right. You start reading the New Testament, it'll just seem so right to you. Everybody needs to go through that. The Word of God will tell you, it will give you purpose. The Word of God will tell you your purpose in life. How many of you want purpose in life? Yeah. The Word of God will tell you your purpose in life. You'll find it. The Word of God will show you how to succeed in life. Now some people kind of somehow become outwardly successful, it seems, without God. Very few. And truly, no one becomes truly successful without God. Because there's inherent character things and spiritual things that cause success. But then there's natural things that cause success. You do the spiritual thing right, you'll succeed naturally. If you ignore all the wisdom of God uh, for 18 years, you can forget it. If you ignore all the wisdom of God for 18 years, your next 10 years is going to be real rocky. Hopefully you can get saved and start learning the truth soon because then you can reverse course. Amen. Hallelujah. It's getting real quiet in here. Almost lunchtime, I suppose. <laughs> the Word of God will show you how to tap into the supernatural. Amen. How to get actual miracles from God. How to, how to really have true things happen in your life that are miraculous. Not just coincidental, 
not just, well, it was, a, it was a nice little thing that seemed to happen. We think that might have been God. We're talking about just real supernatural living. Yeah. We're talking about calm in the storm type living. We're talking about moving mountain type of living. The Word of God will show you this type thing. Some of you got some of the some of you got so many mountains, or we could say some of the sinners out there have so many mountains they have no clue what to do with those things. We found out how to overcome, how to move them, how to go over them, how to walk through them, how to uh, obliterate mountains. The Word of God will show you how to run a business. Listen, listen. This is the Word of God. Yeah. I'm not just playing around here. This is, matter of fact, let me, let me just tell you this. This is something that Brother Wigglesworth said. He said, never compare the Word of God with other books. Amen. Comparisons are dangerous. He said, never think or say that this book contains the words of God. It is the Word of God. Amen. It is supernatural in origin. It is eternal in duration. It's inexpressible in value. It's infinite in scope. It's regenerative in power. It's infallible in, in authority. It's universal in interest. It's personal in application. This Word of God is inspired in totality. Read it through, write it down, pray it in, work it out, and then pass it on. And then truly the Word of God will change a man until he becomes a letter, an epistle of Christ. Amen. This Word of God will show you how to raise your children. Really. Parents that try to raise their children just with the American culture is dependent on how well that culture is going. Culture in the 40s, different than culture in the 80s, different than culture in the 2010s. Interesting, isn't it? You cannot raise your children based on culture, based on books written by modern secular Dr. Spocks and Oprah's fills. Forget it. Forget it. The book of Proverbs, if you want to raise your children, you're going to have to teach them the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs train you in, in all the ways of life. Some of you adults need Proverbs training. Amen. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the wisdom of God through King Solomon so that you and I know how to live in this life. Then the cross comes, a lot of things change, and a lot of things are enhanced, but the book of Proverbs is necessary for you. You got to know how right, how, how right things, how right spiritual things are applied in a person's life. So just teach your, ch your children the book of Proverbs. Go 31, book, 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. You could teach your children that at least once every six months. Amen. Any children in here? Or are they all in the back? Children, remind your parents to teach you Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. The Word of God will show you how to live long. How many of you want to live long? Yeah. How many of you like to live long? Yeah. How many of you want to live long? Yeah. You can buy a health food book or you can read Proverbs. Come on. Proverbs 3 verse 1. My son, do not forget my law or my word, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace will they add to you. Yeah. It's right there. The Word of God will add life to you. Verse 9, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. If you can't honor God with your money, then your barns won't be filled and your vats won't overflow. Verse 13, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for her proceeds. Who, who is her? Wisdom and understanding. Her proceeds are better than profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She's more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. This is wisdom and understanding is better than gold and silver and rubies. How many of you would like gold and silver and rubies? It's not a trick question. Those are pretty. <laughs> Ladies, 
This is your big chance. How many of you want gold, silver, and rubies? How many of you like a bucket full of gold? <laughs> Glory to God. If I had a bucket of gold, silver, and rubies, and a Bible, what would you choose? In your heart, you're supposed to be going through this and recognizing how valuable God is saying that wisdom and understanding is. Therefore, it's amazing where, why a heathen who doesn't know the Word would think he's wiser than a Christian who does know the Word. Amen. Amen. That's right. Just put us in a room together. You ever thought that before? Amen. Let's just get in a room together. I'll fix all of your stupidity. <laughs> It's the truth. Once you get the wisdom of God, you could do that. You're not going to do that. You're not going to cast pearls before swine and get into arguments, but you could if you wanted. Yeah. Jesus got in rooms with people, and they tried to trick him, and he always flipped it. He, he flipped the table so much, they said, we're not going to ask this dude anything else. He scared them so much about their religiosity that they walk off thinking, forget it. We're going to leave him alone. Nobody wants to get beat up that much by the truth. All right. Look at uh, chapter 4 here, verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Let, incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Keep what in the midst of your heart? My words, my words. Give attention. My son, give a, this is how you teach your children. Give attention to my words. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the... Verse 22, for they are life to those who find them. The words are life to you if you find them. Amen. That's why you ought to be underlining. Yeah. You ought to be bookmarking or tagging or whatever you can do. Amen. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Hallelujah. Your body can be made healthy with uh, broccoli or it can be made healthy with the Word of God. Amen. Now some smart aleck will say, how about both? Yeah. Well, because I don't like broccoli, that's why. <laughs> I'm not against good eating and right, and right diet and all that. I'm not against that. Doing things in moderation and wisely. But I'm also not afraid of jacking the box. I mean, on my, on my weekly uh, diet plan is grease. I want some grease and give it to me at least once or twice a week. Oh, I know all the health food folks are really mad at me right now. Just hang in there, hang in there. Hang in there. It's okay to do that if you want to. Just don't let it become a God to you. You know, humans have this, we have this ability to create all sorts of gods that we worship. Gods that we, that we raise the flag to. Whether it's save the earth or how you eat or I like Chevrolet better than Ford. I'm a Ford guy. I'm a Chevy guy. I'm a Ford guy. We got these gods that we just, we think it's so important to attach ourselves to, to feel valuable. Like I've made my choice. Well, just make your choice for Christ. Make your choice for Christ. Be a, be a proponent for the cause of Christ. Let that be your only cause. I said let that be your only cause. Listen, the cause of Christ is the only cause in the whole wide world that will not lead to corruption. The only one. If you're living with a cause... You'll get corrupted somehow, somewhere. Whether it's money or fame or glory or something will go wrong if you're living for any cause except the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. Do things by principle, not by cause. You don't need a cause. We don't need a new cause to live for. You need to live for the cause of Christ. Be a, be a, a, a man of God or a woman of God. Be a person of God. That is your cause. Hallelujah. That gives you a purpose right there. Be a person of God. That's a cause, man. The world needs to see a real Christian. They're tired of flimsy Christians who can't love a nickel. I guess money is not a good analogy there, but... Can't heal a flea, can't love a... 
a ladybug, I don't know. All right, praise the Lord. If we just pause long enough, it'll be lunchtime. <laughs> Turn with me to Luke chapter 8, please. Uh, no, we've already kind of done that. Yeah, go to Luke 8. It's pretty close to where I want to go next. So number one, you gotta get you gotta get serious about the word. You gotta spend time listening to the word Amen. of God. And that means listening to the word of God taught. That means listening to the word of God as you read the Bible. That means listening to preachers, being okay with other people speaking to you about God. Right. How many of you are okay with other people speaking to you about God? Just go ahead and raise your hand and fake it. <laughs> you need to be okay with other people speaking to you about God. Because it's the way that God chose this thing, okay? So let me talk about this for a moment, that you need to listen rightly. You need to listen to God. God said many times in the Bible, hearken unto me, listen to me. Jesus said, listen. Listen, then he told a story. Listen. How many of you are good listeners? I'm sure some of you need a little help on the listening side, but it pays to listen to God. But you've got to listen right to God. You've got to listen right. Jesus said several times, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. I went to church is not a great testimony. I went to church and listened and learned something and applied it. Now that's a good testimony. Right? You got to listen. Uh, somebody came to Jesus one time and said, Wow, blessed is the womb that bare you and the breast that nursed you. What, what are they saying? They're saying, Oh, your mother's so blessed. To have a son like you. That's not necessarily a bad thing. We do that all the time, don't we? Jesus said, rather, more blessed is he that hears the word of God and does it. Amen. They came to Jesus one time and said, Hey, Jesus, is your mother and your brothers are all outside. They want to come in. It was, it was crowded. They couldn't get in. Hey, your mothers and your brothers are out here. And he's like, Who are my mothers and my brother? But he that hears the word of God and keeps it. It's all about hearing the truth and doing it. That pleases God. It's honorable. It'll cause you to be a right person. Hallelujah. It's exciting. But you've got to listen right. You can't listen with, one, listen with both ears. You need to listen with both ears open. Some people listen with one ear open. What do I mean by that? That means you hear what you want to hear. Isn't that right? Three sentences are said, you only heard number two because it matched with what you wanted to do anyway. Kids do it with parents, adults do it with adults, spouses do it with spouses. Isn't that right? You got to be honest in your listening. Your spouse says three things, you harp on one and you take a rabbit trail. When the purpose was number three, that's not fair. That's dishonest listening. So are you a good listener? God said in Psalm, He said, Oh, that my people would listen to me and walk in my ways. Yes. We're talking about listening to God. That's right. Listening to God. Not being skeptical. When the Bible's taught, don't be skeptical. When you read a scripture, don't be skeptical. I've had people come to me after a great message and say, I don't know about that one there. Don't be skeptical. This is the Word of God. You're not supposed to question the Word of God. You're supposed to swallow it. I mean, you can ask questions about how does this make sense, but don't question it like, well, I don't know if that's true or not. It is the truth. Hallelujah. Don't be skeptical about the Word of God. Listen with both ears. Act like it's the truth. Don't. Here's a way, don't major on the minor. Some people read the Bible and they turn, they turn into some weird religion. They create some cult or some just wrong religion. They, they got hung up on like two or three things. How do you know they got hung up on two or three things? Because when you talk to them, that's the only two or three things they ever talk about, those two or three things. That, those are people that, that majored on the minors. They got hung up on something. They didn't listen right. They didn't listen right. You know, the, the weirdos like the snake handlers. There's like two times snakes are mentioned in the New Testament. 
It's ridiculous. But people do it all the time with other things. Like uh, the Bible says that... I've had people tell me this. I invite them to come to church or, hey, you need to read this book or, hey, why don't you watch this online listen to this? And somebody says, well, I don't need anybody to teach me the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. Well, I don't know about that. Is that true or not? If you listen with both ears, you'll understand what the Bible means because the Holy Spirit is your teacher. He is the one to guide you into all truth. Jesus said the, the Comforter will come and He will teach you all things. So the Holy Spirit is your number one teacher. That's right. But that doesn't negate the other scripture that says Jesus gave teachers to the body of Christ to edify. And it doesn't negate the part that says teach one another, encourage one another, minister one to another. Teach all things that I've told you. You follow me? But if you listen with one ear, you just hear that part that allows you to stay home and do nothing. That's good. That's good. Allows you to stay home and not give any money to God, not be part of anything in the body of Christ, and try to squeak into heaven. Because you listen with one ear. I'm not against those people. Much. <clears throat> no, I'm not against them, but you know. Sometimes you've got you to challenge people's stupidity. Sometimes you've got to put another ear on somebody. Say, listen, you're missing an ear. Aww. Hey, listen, that's what you can do with all your lukewarm Christian friends. <laughs> all your nominal Christians, all the, all the ones that aren't, that are just careless, just, you just send them an ear for Christmas. <laughs> I think you need a new ear. You need to add one ear to your hearing so that you can have ears to hear. All right. Amen. Hey, you know, one, one thing I want you to do is I want you to recognize that what we've, what we've committed our life to is a big deal. Listen, this half-hearted this half commitment to Jesus, is, is that's not good. This is a big deal. This is all in. This is reality. This is spiritual. I mean, if you walk with Jesus, He is very challenging. He is very challenging. And He didn't have a problem. If you can't, if you can't handle the challenge, go. Now, y'all can't go. The ushers are to lock the doors. But Jesus would say that. He'd give them some hard saying, and they're like, okay, we're gone. We can't handle this. Uh, here's one. Here's one. Here's in the book of James. This is... This is, this is a false doctrine. Listen, this is a false doctrine. It, it, it is spread, at least 50% of the church has come across this. Many of them live in this false teaching right here. Okay, here's, here's, here's where they only have one ear. James 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Some people, one ear, they stop right there. Don't read the rest of the chapter. And they say, see, God gives us tests, and we're just going to praise God in it. Look, pr make sure you praise God and count it all joy when you go through tough stuff. Right. You've got to stay rejoicing even though it's tough. You've got to count it joy like we talked about last week. Yeah, Didn't we say this just last week? Yeah. Count it joy. Glory to God. i got a trial. Woo! Yeah. Rather than, I've got a trial. Everybody pray. <laughs> but it doesn't say that God gave you it says count it all joy when you fall into right. not when God gives you That's right. it says count it all joy when you fall into not when God gives you trials right. That's right. and then if you read the rest of the chapter it says Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life. Verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted. Now that word tempted yes. in the Greek means tempted, tested, or tried. Same exact context, same chapter. Tempted equals tested or tried. Yes. You know what that means? You can be tempted to sin, but you can also be tempted to give up. Mm -hmm. Right? Tempted right. to give up, tested, my faith was tested. It's the same word. It's piera. It's the Greek word P-I-E-R-A. And it means all three. Tempt, test, or prove. 
Let no man say when he's tempted. Now your Bible says tempted. I don't know why they didn't use test because they already used tested. Let no one say when he's tempted or tested or proved that I'm tempted or tested by God. For God cannot be tempted or tested by evil, nor does he himself tempt or test anyone. That's right. Amen. Amen. So if it's, a, if it's a destructive thing that's come to you, count it all joy. Because yeah. 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 The it's the trying of your faith. And if you come out on top, you'll have some patience and you'll be strong. Yeah. Smith Wigglesworth said, Great faith is a result of great trials. Mm -hmm. But don't you dare say that God gave you that to make you strong. That's right. That's right. It says, Do not let anyone say when he's tested, that he's tested by God. For God doesn't test anybody with evil. God will never give you an evil thing to test you. The world will give you stuff. The devil will give you stuff. But don't ever say God gives you evil stuff to test you. We go through tons of tests, but it's not from God. God's training you ahead of time so you can pass the test. Holding your hand through the test, encourage you to win, and then he's rejoicing with you when you overcome the test. But he's not the giver of the test. Isn't that good news? So if you read it with both ears open, that's what you find. Verse 17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. So good things come from above. Amen. Now this whole shadow of turning thing is a sundial. The lesson of the sundial, which, which refers to a shadow that changes throughout the day. God is not like that. He doesn't change throughout the day. Hallelujah. He's good in the morning. He's Hallelujah. good in the evening. He's good on Monday. He's good on Friday. He gives good things on Tuesday, good things on Thursday. He's the same all the time. Or we could just say His shadow is stuck in one spot. Sweet water comes out of the fountain, never bitter water. What you get from God is good and only good and never bad and never both. That's a truth you have to learn from the Word of God and you can only learn it if you have both ears open. You can only learn it if you, if you filter out some of the wrong teaching that you've heard before. People that say that tongues have ceased are only listening with one ear. Tongues have not ceased. Amen. The person that listened with only one ear says, yeah, but there's a scripture that says uh, one day tongues will cease. They're, tr they're right. That same, that same scripture, the same sentence says tongues will cease, prophecies will fail, and knowledge will pass away when that which is perfect has come. Well, knowledge hadn't passed away. Therefore, that which is perfect must not have come yet. Therefore, prophecies are still alive and active. And tongues is still alive and active. And knowledge is certainly still alive and active. When Jesus, who is perfect, comes again, then we won't need tongues and prophecies. You understand? And we won't have to do all this learning quite like we're doing right now. I mean, you're going to have to know it. I don't know how he'll do it, but it'll be imparted to you. Amen. Some people listen with one, only one ear whenever they hear about the prosperity that God promises in the Bible, that He will supply all your need with abundance. That if you walk with God, wealth and riches will be in your house. If you serve Him all your life, if you seek first the kingdom of God, then He'll take good care of you. Right? Now some people hear that and run off saying, God wants me rich. Bye-bye church, got to go get a job. Excuse me, you do need a job. Everybody needs a job. <laughs> But they start pursuing riches. They listen with one, only one ear. And, and I watched in, in the past two decades, a great revelation was taught on television where we recognize that God does not need us broke and poor. Amen. Right. That's right. That does not depict a Christian being broke and poor. That is not what God's looking for. That's right. He's looking for you to walk with Him in principle, following His money principles, loving, loving Him with all your heart, serving Him with all your heart. Oh, and by the way, uh, you'll have plenty. Yeah. That's the prosperity of God. Amen. She's actually expressing her happiness. <laughs> or he. Hallelujah. Are we in Luke? Go to Luke with me. We're almost done.
Yeah, this is a good one. This is kind of along the same line as, as this James thing, but one ear people, that, that's, that can be the title of the message, one ear people. <laughs> missing, the missing ear. The missing ear people. Okay, verse 23. This is Luke 9, 23. Luke 9, 23. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what the, King James, the New King James Version reads this way. I just want you to recognize how, how it's so easy to forget an ear. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is Jesus. If anyone wants to follow Jesus, you've got to deny yourself. Amen. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost? For whosoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and the holy angels. Stop there. The point is, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to give up your life. You've got to give up yourself. Has anybody done that? It's a challenge to us all. You have to recognize, to succeed as a Christian, you have to be willing to give up yourself. Give up your reputation etc., 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 etc. Now, he says, take up his cross and follow me. Take up your cross is the identification with the cross of Christ. Everybody okay with that? To take up your cross and follow him is the identification with the cross of Christ, which is Jesus gave up his own will for the will of the Father. Remember in the garden before the cross, he said, Father, if it be thy will... Let this cup pass from me. Or Jesus actually said, Let this cup pass from me, but if it be thy will, I'll go to the cross. He didn't want to die, but he gave up his own will to go to the cross. You with me? He gave up his self-desire for the desire of God. And that's what the cross represents in this passage. Take up your cross, meaning you let go of your selfish desire, your selfishness, and you take up the sacrifice toward God. I'll serve God instead of myself. That's what this means. It means you give up your reputation, you give up your worldly pursuits, all of your treasure-seeking and all of those other things that are very worldly and not God's will. Amen. But if you only listen with one ear, many people have said this, that if you have a sickness or you're born with a problem, they say, well, that's just your cross to bear. You ever heard that before? Someone has some calamity that plagues them. Maybe it's being poor all their life, well, that's just my cross to bear. Maybe it's where they were born, well, that's just my cross to bear. Maybe it's their race, well, that's just my cross to bear. Maybe it's their child, childhood trauma, well, that's just my cross to bear, I guess. That's not what he's talking about. Listen, that is not what he's talking about. He's not saying live with... God gave you some terrible thing in life, live with it. That's not what he's saying. But people have said that for... How many of you have heard that saying? Look at that, look at that. Raise your hand, I want to see. How many of you heard that? That's like... 70, that's 80% of you have heard that statement. It's a completely wrong statement. Take up your cross means serve Jesus. Take up your cross means sacrifice your natural life to live for God. Interesting, isn't it? It's so, that false teaching, that one ear teaching has permeated the church so much that there is an interpretation of the Bible called the Message Bible. Anybody ever read the Message Bible? Which is fantastic in some places because it makes it very common language, just common language to us. But it's not, it's not a translation, it's an interpretation. Meaning, they take the sentences and then say what they think it's meaning. That means it's very important who interpreted it, right? That's right. So what we're doing here explaining things is interpreting. What the scripture is as written is translated. You with me? 
So the New King James and several others that we recommend are translations, meaning they took a word and made the word in English come to pass. They took the Greek word and turned it into English and put all those words in a sentence, and now we have as close as we can get in English to the original writings. That's what a translation is. An interpretation is somebody or a group of people sat around and thought, what does this mean? That's okay to do if you're writing a book. It's not okay to do and say this is a Bible. Amen. Amen. That's right. I'm not against the Message Bible and the NIV and some of the other interpretations, but they're not translations. Therefore, don't use them as your main Bible. Amen. Amen. There's your Bible reading 101 lesson. Amen. Everybody heard it? Yes. You can use those Bibles. I have them as reference. That's how I found these things. But they're not your main Bible. That's right. Here's what the Message Bible says in this in this. And notice all the extra words added and all the extra interpretations added. It says this, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. It's pretty good. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. It's pretty good. We like that. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Where did suffering show up here? I don't see suffering in this passage. Did y'all see suffering anywhere in this passage? No. I see take up his cross and follow me. I don't see suffering. So it says, don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. It sounds so noble, doesn't it? It sounds so religious, doesn't it? Just embrace your suffering. God has a reason. <laughs> We have no clue what God's doing, but just embrace it all. No, no, the Bible says resist the devil. Right. Cast out the devil. That's right. Give no place to the devil. Yes. Right. Don't even consider evil. Mm -hmm. Resist anything terrible. Yeah. Completely use your faith to stand firm against the wiles of the devil. That's right. Right. Amen. That means you've got to learn what the wiles of the devil are. Jesus showed us what the wiles of the devil... There's a scripture that says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Jesus went about doing good, healing people oppressed by the devil. <coughs> Think of all the people that got sick, suffering, and read that, that message Bible passage and thought, I'm just going to embrace my sickness. Why don't you let Jesus heal you from the oppression of the devil? Amen. See the difference between one ear and two ears? Yes. That translation said, continues to say some good things. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way. I can't read my writing, so whatever. <laughs> It finishes with what good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you. So 90% wonderful, 10% no bueno. So you got to listen rightly. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. All right, you ready for the final scripture? Amen. How long have you been ready for the final scripture? <laughs> Revelation 19, go to Revelation, towards the back, don't get scared, it's not hot. <laughs> Revelation 19, I'll mention this, so number one is the Word of God, you're going to have to spend time going after the Word of God. You're going to have to desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow there, but you're going to have to desire it like, like a baby wants his bottle, you're going to have to want the Word of God. And if you never get there, I can't help you much. Really, honestly, Christians can't help you much if you're, not, if you're not desiring the Bible and the teaching of the words of God like a baby wants his bottle. What happens when a baby doesn't get his bottle? Cries. Cries. You need to be frantic if you're not getting your word of God. I don't care what the family wants of you. I don't care what the friends or the job or whatever, the event. You've got to be frantic to get to the word of God. On a daily basis, a weekly basis, a consistent basis. How about that? Just one chapter a day would change your life. Amen. Amen. 
Revelation 19. We'll just cap it off with the Word of God here. How about that? Amen. Revelation 19. This is when Jesus appears, sets foot back on earth with ten thousands of His All of His saints come with Him to rule the earth for a thousand years. Did y'all... How many of you want to rule the earth? Raise your hand. Come on. How many of you want to rule the earth? Every one of you like want to rule the earth. Every one of you is already trying to rule the house. Every child in here would rule the house if mom and dad would let them, right? Everybody in here wants to rule your company. Isn't that right? Everybody wants to rule their boss. Everybody wants to have a say-so. Everybody wants their voice heard. Everybody wants to rule the country. They do. They do too. There's a thing in us all about having some authority and some power. We're going to get to rule the whole earth for a thousand years. We're going to get to dominate every political system, every media system. We're going to get to dominate every courtroom, every school. We will be the rulers of the earth for a thousand years. Did you know that was in your future? We're ruling the earth. I'm already picking my cities. I'm already picking my arenas that I want to be in charge of. Come on, street lights. Years ago, I used to be so fed up with street lights that weren't timed properly. You know, there's no reason to stop it two in a row. There's just no reason. There's got to be some mathematical geniuses that could figure this out. You don't have to stop it two in a row. You stop it one, you should be flowing for at least three or four. It's ridiculous. And I complained about it so much, I decided, or Joni, I think, decided for me, God's going to put you in charge of streetlights in the thousand-year reign of Christ. Some of you will be in charge of uh, Fox News. Yep, yep. And some of you will be in charge of the... We'll be the judges. We'll be the ones deciding what's right and what's wrong. We won't need 12 people to decide. We won't need Dumbo deciding for the nation. Nine Dumbos making, making laws. You know, we won't have any of that. It's going to be Christians with the wisdom of God in new, new holy bodies. Listen, when you come back to reign, you're in a glorified body that's not susceptible to any sin. Woo! You come back to reign on this earth, we have, we have ultimate faith. You won't have to struggle to try to follow Jesus. And you'll have such love that the whole earth just can hardly, hardly resist it. So here's what happens on that final moment when Jesus comes during this battle. This is what happens. Verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Thank you, Lord. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and, and wrath of God Almighty, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm closing the book. Hallelujah. We know the end. It ends with the Word of God setting foot on earth. I'm just glad we're in it with Him. Amen. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men. 